Salve mates, I hope everything is covered in Tuscan sunshine at your end. In today's video I'm gonna be ranking the enemies of the Roman Republic from the most gentle to the deadliest. It will be based on four criteria, battles, will to fight, threat and diplomatic unreliability. The battles value is simple, the more and deadliest battles, higher the score. The will to fight the Romans shows the ability of the nation to keep on fighting even when the odds were against them, or they became war weary. It measures the resilience as well as the will of the nation to fight to the bitter end. Another two criteria, threat and diplomatic unreliability. The threat is based on how the other faction threatened the city of Rome or the Roman power. And finally, diplomatic unreliability, that is basically doing anything on the diplomatic field that might be harmful to the Republic. So without further ado, let's get to number 19, the least dangerous faction on the list. Number 19, Cyprus. The beautiful island of Cyprus is the only faction with zero points. The Cypriots, although technically enemies of Rome for a short time, put up no defenses when the Romans attacked them. The causus belli was that the last Cyprian king Ptolemy refused to pay for a ransom of a Roman people's tribune, who had been captured by pirates. Cyprus was then abruptly annexed by Rome and Ptolemy poisoned himself. Number 18, Crete, Thrace, Pergamon and Galatia. These four nations are virtually tied. In terms of being the enemies of the Roman Republic, these factions were something what I would call one battle enemies, because it usually took Romans only one battle or a campaign to subdue them. Thracians, although regarded as warlike, ferocious, bloodthirsty and barbarian, were complete puppies towards the Romans. It took Rome only a single campaign to force them to accept Rome's hegemony in 179 BC, followed by a peaceful transition to Rome's protectorate in 11 BC, and then finally in AD 46 they became Roman province. All in a single campaign. Remarkable. Celtic Galatians in Anatolia followed a similar pattern. They were defeated in the Battle of Mount Olympus and in the Battle of Ancyra. Then they existed only as a buffer state between Rome and Pontus. After Pontus' defeat, Galatians outlived their usefulness and the buffer state was peacefully made into a Roman province in 25 BC. An ancient city-state Pergamon was bequeathed to Rome in 133 BC by King Attalus III, who was without an heir. This was challenged by Aristonicus, who claimed to be Attalus' brother and led an armed uprising against the Romans. For a period he enjoyed success, even managed to get a Roman consul killed. The whole affair was rather an embarrassment to the Romans, who were so fed up with cities teaming up with Aristonicus that they poisoned their water and food supplies while torturing and killing prisoners. And finally Crete. Crete made an alliance with Pontus during the Roman wars against Mithridates, which resulted in a Roman invasion of the island in 71 BC. The Roman commander of the naval force, Marcus Antonius, father of the famous Mark Antony, was totally defeated and most of his ships were sunk. As a result of this defeat, he was mockingly given the cognomen Creticus, which either means conqueror of Crete or a man made of chalk. The island was then conquered, however, by Quintus Metellus after a ferocious three-year siege of Gnosis. Number 17, Sardinians. These nations consisted of tribes of Corsi, Balari and Eulales. The island itself belonged to Carthage and was basically stolen by Rome after the First Punic War, which meant that Romans had to deal with its barbaric inhabitants. 
Sardinians were so out of touch with what was going on in the Mediterranean, they didn't even get to choose their own new masters. Their only notable thing as Roman enemies is that they rebelled every 30 years or so and were always defeated and always enslaved. Therefore, they get some points for unreliability, but that's it. Romans also perceived Sardinians as too retarded, so it's hard to find any more information about those rebellions, but overall I believe they were more annoying than dangerous for Romans. Number 16. Egypt. Egypt was nothing but a blot on Roman sight. Already since Sulla, Rome played Egypt like a fiddle. And a civil war in torn Egypt played its part. Its rulers and pretenders were more than happy to become pieces on the Roman chessboard. The only time Egypt defied Rome on a battlefield, unsuccessfully of course, was in the Battle of the Nile against Julius Caesar. The other half points for the battle score is for the Battle of Actium at 31 BC. Egyptian Queen Cleopatra indeed took part in one of the most crucial battles of Rome's history, but after heavy fighting, Cleopatra broke from the engagement she had with Mark Antony and set course for Egypt with 60 of her ships. Egypt was then peacefully made into a Roman province without any Egyptian lifting a finger against Octavian. The only number that pumps the overall score is the threat. Egypt indeed threatened Rome's existence, but it is only because of the presence of a single man, Mark Antony, a famous general of Julius Caesar who raised Egypt from obscurity and submission and elevated the state into his own equal partner. And all of that because of Cleopatra. Number 15. Syracuse. The Greek city of Syracuse remained a loyal ally to the Romans against Carthage during the First Punic War. But that was undone by their treacherous backstabbing of Rome during the war against Hannibal. Alliance with Carthage during the darkest times the Roman Republic had ever been through, however, didn't pay off. Syracuse was besieged by the Romans in 213 BC and was destroyed a year and a half later in a bloody battle. The imminent threat of losing the whole island of Sicily was luckily put out in time by the Romans but it was a close call. Number 14. Numidia. The Jugurthian War is one of the saddest examples of how Romans sometimes badly treated nations that were on their side and how they caved into angry mobs too often. Numidian king Jugurtha was a staunch Roman ally and a commander in the service of Rome, who had successfully defeated Iberians in the siege of Numentia, along with his good friend Scipio Emilianus. After he had defeated and killed his Numidian co-rulers, he did his best to remain friends with Rome, but it was done through assassinations and bribery. This caused an upheaval of the Roman mob, which forced the Roman Senate to declare war on Numidia. Even then, Jugurtha tried to play a I am a nice guy card and refused to meet Romans on the battlefield. Partially because he didn't intend to piss them off, partially because he knew his army is inferior to the Roman legions, because according to Salustinus, Numidians were protected more by their legs than by their weapons. Jugurtha knew he had no chance and he never stopped believing that the Romans would come to terms with him even after the real battles had been fought between them. Unfortunately for Jugurtha, Romans didn't intend to negotiate with the king and after a long and for Rome embarrassing six years, Jugurtha was defeated and Numidia conquered. Number 13. Seleucid Empire You guys ever heard the phrase, size isn't everything? <laughs> 
Of course you haven't, you are the Roman fans, you have massive genitalia, but you know the meaning of the saying. The Seleucid Empire is an example of that saying. It was one of the largest empires in history, but it was so fragile and its rulers were always running around the country being on damage control. Romans were surprised at first when the Seleucid king Antiochus III, along with his outcasted military advisor Hannibal, invaded Greece in 192 BC. But the Romans managed to utterly defeat them in all battles during the short Seleucid War. The final battle, the Battle of Magnesia, was such a disaster that Antiochus then had to sue for peace. After that, Romans didn't see much of Seleucids for over 100 years. Only after then, in 69 BC, when the famous Roman statesman Pompey was casually marching through the Middle East, he saw the Seleucids as too troublesome to continue on their own and he made Seleucid Syria into a Roman province. Number 12. Illyrians. Livy described the Illyrians as nations of savages who were infamous for their piracy. Romans didn't have a hard time conquering them. The region was largely pacified during the interwar period between the Second and the Third Punic War in 146 BC. But unfortunately, there is nothing remarkable about the Roman conquest of Illyria, to be honest. Over the next 200 years after 146 BC, Romans waged around 12 pacifying wars against the Illyrian tribes and all those wars and campaigns did not exceed a time span of months. These wars were usually waged on Roman terms and rarely were the Romans caught off guard, with the major exception being the Great Illyrian Revolt. It was however suppressed also rather quickly and Illyria became Rome's obedient province. Number 11. Transalpine Gauls To keep things slightly more fair, I divided the Gauls geographically into two factions. Transalpine Gauls, aka on the far side of the Alps, and then Cisalpine Gauls, aka on this side of the Alps. This division puts Transalpine Gauls very low and it is mainly because of a single man, Julius Caesar. Caesar managed to conquer 750,000 square kilometers in just two years. The rest of his Gallic campaign between 56 and 54 BC he was flexing in Britannia and Germania. The last two remaining years of his Gallic campaign he devoted to destroying the Vercingetorix rebellion. In terms of the battle score, although the Gallic battles were exceptionally bloody, they were bloody for the Gauls mainly. Caesar was caught off guard only once during the Battle of Gergovia, but all other battles of his campaign were victories for the Romans. The threat score isn't also high, because the Gallic campaign was primarily a gamble of Julius Caesar and his political career, not a campaign that could particularly endanger Rome. Number 10. Greeks, aka Aetolian League, Achaean League, Sparta and Athens, were known, at least by Sulla, to be treacherous. They switched alliances as they pleased, exited and entered wars alongside Rome and against Rome and turned out to be heavily unreliable. Greeks intended to get as much leverage as possible from all other nations like Macedon, the Seleucid Empire, Pontus and Rome. The Romans, however, didn't have the patience to play this dangerous game with them and attack the Greek city-states when they had crossed the line. Then, when Greeks knew they had no chance against Rome, they tended to negotiate and played their heritage card. They usually begged Romans to consider a great Greek history and culture they would endanger if they conquered them. The famous Roman commander Sulla would be the reality check to their intention to use their culture as a shield because when he laid siege to Athens in 87 BC and the Athenians envoys came to Sulla and begged him not to destroy the city, citing its rich history, to which Sulla replied, 
Keep your speech. I was not sent to Athens to learn its history, but to subdue it. Needless to say that Athens ended up as Corinth in 146 BC and Sparta in 195 BC. They paid to have a price. Other than that, there were no main battles fought. The threat the Greeks presented was due to their geographical location near crucial Anatolia, and because of it, Romans needed to sleep with their one eye opened when they campaigned in Anatolia. What also makes their unreliability score higher is piracy. The Aetolian League acquired a reputation for piracy and brigandage. All in all, Greece was, however, more an inconvenience than a real threat. In Tusrorum Imperio Paene Omnis Italia Fuit. Almost all of Italy was under the Etruscan control. The Etruscans were the main player on the Italian peninsula, and Rome had been under their control for over hundreds of years. But the Etruscans were no great warriors. They were scholars, teachers, goldsmiths and artists. And their Italian conquests were not done by the sword, but rather through cultural influence. It cannot come as a surprise that they couldn't put down a small rebellious republic in the heart of Italy that defied them in 510 BC. Through the Etruscan city of Veii, they at least managed to keep them in line, but the change with the Gallic invasion of Etruria in the 4th century. The damage Gauls did to the Etruscans was far more severe than what they had done to Rome. After the Gallic sack of Rome in 387 BC, Romans managed to get back on their feet and fill the power vacuum left after the Gallic invasions. Etruscans could but helplessly watch how Romans marched their legions into their own territory. It is almost laughable how militarily and strategically impotent were the Etruscans. They tried to outwit Romans through treachery, but they always picked horrible timing to do so. Some examples. They attacked the Republic when the Great Samnite War was almost won by the Romans. They attacked the Republic when the Romans had almost won the Perhic War, but they remained loyal to the Romans after the disastrous Battle of Cannae, only to betray them ten years later, when Hannibal's cause in Italy had already been lost. Etruscans was a nation that was just begging to be conquered. Number 8. Cimbrians. The mysterious migrating Cimbrians embarrassed Rome in front of everyone at the height of its power. We don't know whether they were Gauls, Gallic Germans or even Gallic Parthians. Romans don't make it easier for us since they called everyone north of the Alps Gauls. What we do know is that they whooped Rome in three major battles, most notably in the Battle of Arausio, which in terms of losses is regarded as the worst defeat in the history of the ancient Rome, surpassing the Battle of Cannae. It is important to note, however, that Cimbrian primary objective had nothing to do with conquering Rome at first. They were migrating tribes looking for a land to settle on, but they always ended up burning up villages and murdering people. Only after 10 years of running around in Western Europe, they decided to invade Italy, which happened around the same time Romans managed to get themselves out of the mess they found themselves in. Gaius Marius was the man who saved the day and defeated Cimbrians in the Battle of Aqua Sexti and Versailles. Cimbrians were no more, but they managed to cause a lot of damage to Rome's prestige and made a lot of people question Rome's way of winning wars. Number 7. Macedon When you think about the Macedon War, you think of the Legion versus the Phalanx, the Battle of Canoscephale, the Battle of Pydna. When I think about the Macedon War, I think of how incredibly tolerant and thoughtful Romans were when they allowed Macedonians to get away with multiple stabbings in the back. 
The First Macedonian War started when the Romans were on their knees during the war against Hannibal and Macedonians stabbed them in the back, no surprise there. After the Second Macedon War, Rome graciously left Macedon King Philip on the throne despite his defeat in the Battle of Canoscephale. Romans were then a little more smarter with Philip's son Perseus, whom they had defeated in the Third Macedonian War, but not smart enough because they only divided Macedon into four republics. Only after getting fooled for the fourth time by an obscure figure by the name Andriscus, who had claimed to be the rightful ruler of Macedons, the Romans decided not to get fooled for the fifth time and went for the direct occupation. As you can see on the scoreboard, it makes more sense now. Macedonians were brave enough to stand up against the Romans, but their success was rather in an element of surprise, in a sudden and inconvenient rebellion that commanded sudden attention of the Roman legions, not on a battlefield. Number 6. Terras and Epirus The only aspect that connected the Greek city of Terras and Epirus region was the king Pyrrhus. An angry Terras mob sank four Roman ships in its harbor in 282 BC and seeing they screwed up badly, they begged Epirus and his king for help. When he arrived, he turned out to be a huge threat for the Romans especially when he ended up being just two days of marching from Rome. The three battles fought in so-called Pyrrhic War were also very bloody for Romans, which pumps up the battle score. The will to fight score is lowered, however, because of Terra's presence and also Pyrrhus' instability. Pyrrhus wanted to become the next Alexander the Great, but his ADHD syndrome forced him to switch between campaign goals and that made him easier to handle. Then combine it with Terras, that surrendered to the Romans without putting up a fight the second Pyrrhus had sailed back to his homeland. And there you see why it only has three points. Also the certain amount of treachery of the Greek city must be mentioned because of its rebellion against Rome during the Second Punic War. And also because their politician defecated on a Roman diplomat during a peace negotiations. Number 5. Pontus Mithridates the sixth of Pontus is sometimes compared to Hannibal, but the only thing they had in common was a total hatred for Rome and a love for committing suicide by poisoning. Otherwise, Mithridates was not a man who could fill Hannibal's shoes. He caused some problems to the Romans by attacking them during their war against the Italic allies, but even his eagerness to reconquer Anatolia was limited. In terms of battle score, although the battles between Pontus and Rome were one of the largest and toughest in ancient history, Mithridates had been defeated in most of them during the Mithridatic Wars. However, the willingness of Mithridates to burn all the bridges behind him made him a fierce opponent for the Romans. Like when he launched a literal genocide of the Roman merchants during around 80,000 Romans were slaughtered. Or when he dragged half of Caucasus into the war against Rome. Some credit also needs to be given to his resilience because he needed to be crushed in three separate wars to be finally defeated. He also needed to be kicked out of his homeland twice. But unfortunately for Pontus, his eagerness and ego didn't match his war-waging capabilities. Number 4. Iberia If anyone tells you, you are obsessed with some girl who keeps rejecting you, Remind them that Romans spent 200 years conquering Iberia, while getting defeated every step of the way. The inhabitants of the peninsula fought like lions to fend off the Romans, and every year the conquest of Iberia always went like this. Step number one, 
the new self-confident consul arrives in Iberia with a new army prepared to end this long, tedious and a popular war once and for all. Step number two, he messes things up even more. Step 3, the no longer self-confident consul, if alive, sees that the war is beyond his capabilities and hides in some safe space, waiting for his next year replacement. Step number 4, repeat. And the situation with the Roman soldiers wasn't that much better. While all Roman citizens' soldiers wanted to participate in Rome wars because of spoils, the Tiberian War was extremely unpopular because there were no big cities to be sacked and therefore no easy money to be made. Romans were forced to conquer Iberia through bribery and scheming and not through military wit. If you want to keep some respect for the Romans after this, don't look up how they treated Viriathus, a Lusitanian independence leader against Rome. The only larger battle was the siege of Numantia and if you consider the time spawn, the strength comparison is just laughable. So when we look at the scoreboard, most of the battle fought between Romans and Iberians were small skirmishes, but the sheer fanatism of Iberians to defend themselves against the Roman Republic for such a long period of time gives them an easy 10 out of 10. The threat score is a little bit lower, because the Iberian objective was not to conquer Rome or even oust Romans from Iberia. No, their only goal was to remain independent. Volsci, Larins, Samnites, Brutii, Sabines, so many tribes, so many wars. Italic tribes just loved to gang up on Rome over and over again and Rome defended itself until it controlled all of Italy. It is important, however, to point out that a huge part of those wars between Rome and Italics were spoil wars, not conquests. Also, most of the nations weren't conquered, but rather forced into an alliance with Rome. But due to close presence to the city of Rome, these nations presented a huge danger. They were also heavily unreliable, always demanding more rights and more privileges. And a lot of those tribes stabbed Rome in its back during the Second Punic War after the disastrous Cannae battle. They also rose up during the so-called Social War, where, for the first time in Roman history, freedmen were called to arms. The most treacherous and warlike tribe among Italics were Samnites, who didn't pass any chance to double-cross the Republic. Only after the Social War, when most of the Italic tribes were given Roman citizenship, Italics finally became obedient and trustful. Number 2. Cisalpine Gauls, aka Gauls in Italy, were unreliable, nasty, mean sons of bitches that periodically caused problems or sometimes even disasters for the Romans. Since 387, when the tribes of Senons sacked Rome, the Romans had almost an irrational fear of Gauls. Cisalpine Gauls were unreliable, like Insubri tribe, they broke treaties easily, Senumani tribe, and some of them were fanatically belligerent towards Rome, Boiai tribe. When the Romans finally managed to pacify those Gallic tribes around 220 BC, Hannibal arrived and Gauls were more than happy to join him on his vendetta against the Republic. They became his most trusted allies and battled Romans even 20 years later during the Roman campaign in Africa. Even after the end of the Second Punic War, tribes like Ligurians entrenched themselves in the Alps from where they periodically descended to plunder the surrounding territories. The only comfort the Romans could find was that the Gauls fought the battles, relying mostly on the fear factor. If the Roman legions didn't collapse after the first forceful Gallic attack, then the Gauls were then likely to lose heart and disperse. Number 
Number one, Carthage. The Carthaginian Empire is the ultimate number one enemy of the Roman Republic. The number of battles is an easy 10 out of 10 on the scoreboard, incomparable with any other faction. The Carthaginian general Hannibal himself alone could be responsible for the 10 points on the scoreboard himself because no one else caused so much trouble to the Roman Republic. After the deadly battle of Cannae in 216 BC, Rome was on the brink of collapse. And if you think about it, Hannibal acted largely on his own, being primarily supported by his Barca house domain in Iberia, not by Carthage itself. One must wonder what could have happened if Carthage stepped in and helped his general. This is where we get to the will to fight and why it isn't also 10. Carthaginians didn't really wish to fight anyone, especially not Romans. They did nothing, for example, when Romans unrightfully stole Sardinia and Corsica from them after the First Punic War. Now compare it with the Romans, who had suffered terrible losses during the Camarina storm disaster and then after the Battle of Drepena against Carthage. The Roman Republic was broke, unable to continue the First Punic War any longer. How were they able to win it anyway? Because every Roman chipped in, the senators, patricians, plebeians all gave their money to the state so Rome could build more ships to win the war. Such a generosity and patriotism was unthinkable in Carthage. Combine it with the reluctance of Carthage to support Hannibal, together with the defeatism of Hanno II, a Carthaginian politician, who was an outspoken opponent of the war against Rome, and you get the will to fight the Romans you see. What drives the number up, on the other hand, is the fanatism of Carthaginians to defend their city during the final Third Punic War after Romans told them that the only possible way that they coexist is that Carthaginians abandon their city and relocate 10 miles away from the sea, Carthage then would be destroyed. The outcry of the citizens was so strong that they prepared for the last futile resistance against Rome. Carthaginian men demolished their stone buildings to make projectiles for catapults, their women cut their hair to make rope for the defensive siege engines and weapons were also obtained by melting vessels. It is like Carthaginians became a completely different nation. Finally, regarding diplomatic unreliability, Carthage is somewhere in between. On the one hand, they held a peace treaty between Rome and Carthage and paid the war reparations to Rome. They also acted as their submissive ally until Rome decided that Carthage Delenda Est. On the other hand, Hannibal was the one who started the Second Punic War by laying siege to Saguntum in Hispania. He also made goals into his allies. Carthaginians then bribed Iberian mercenaries to betray Romans in Iberia, which led to the destruction of multiple legions and the death of Publius Cornelius Scipio, a Roman consul in 218 BC. Carthage also attempted to assassinate the Roman diplomats by the end of the Second Punic War and they also stalled diplomatic negotiations in order to give Hannibal some time to return back from Italy to Carthage to defend it against Scipio Africanus. So all in all, Carthage gets 33 points and becomes the deadliest enemy of the Roman Republic. Okay mates, this is the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed making it. Let me know in the comments what you think. God bless you and God bless the Roman Empire.